Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 333. And this time I'm going to talk about this record by Bud Shank from 1965. Bud Shank and his Brazilian friends, including Joao Donato. And this is an original 1965 mono pressing on Pacific Jazz. And it is a record with a really fascinating story arc. Bud Shank rarely gets mentioned these days. Mostly, of course, he's remembered as a West Coast cool school player, but this is not a cool jazz record. It's a bossa nova record. And I had one story that I wanted to tell originally about this and kind of place this record amongst the better jazz bossa crossover efforts of the 1960s by American jazz men. And then I read a fascinating interview conducted by Mark Myers, which is on his blog, Jazz Wax. And that interview changed my mind entirely as to what the story of this record is, because as it happens, Bud Shank has a really central place in the history of the emergence of Bossa Nova, and this record is a part of that story. Bud Shank was born in Dayton, Ohio in May 1926. But by the time he went to university at the University of North Carolina in 1944, he was focused on the alto and the flute as his main instruments. He studies business there, but he only lasts about two years. In 1946, he drops out, he hitches a ride with a friend out to LA and just immerses himself in the jazz scene. He started off working with Shorty Rogers and then in Charlie Barnett's band. And then in 1950, he gets a gig with the Stan Kenton Orchestra. Shank had a fairly typical West Coast apprenticeship with Kenton. And then after a couple of years in 1952, he leaves to go and work on doing small combo work in LA. And this was quite a common thing to do. In fact, there was a huge network of former Kentonites, the Kenton Mafia, all the way through the West Coast jazz scene who were regularly playing together, often at the Lighthouse Cafe, where regular concerts were being organized by Kenton's former bass player, Howard Rumsey. Back in his Kenton days, Shank had worked with a Brazilian guitarist, a guy called Lorinda Almeida, who had moved to L.A. from Rio in 1947. And he'd gotten a job with the Kenton band at the time, because in the late 40s, Afro-Cuban Latin jazz was going through its first big wave, thanks to Dizzy Gillespie, and Almeida ends up playing with Kenton until 1952 for the last two of those years with Bud Shank. After Almeida leaves Kenton in 1952, he begins to work with the bassist Harry Babison on the Sunset Strip, playing mainly Latin-themed jazz. They liked the sound they were getting, but they wanted to experiment, so they added a saxophone, Bud Shank, and a drummer, Roy Hart. And in 1953 and 1954, Almeida and Shank made two different 10-inch records for Pacific Jazz called the Lorinda Almeida Quartet featuring Bud Shank, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And those were reissued in 1955 as a 12-inch LP, which you can get hold of uh, called the Lorindo Almeida Quartet featuring Bud Shank. It's also been reissued as a bunch of different things. I think the most common title is as Brazilians. Anyway, kind of amazing music because what they conjure up is bossa nova, but it's not bossa nova because bossa nova hasn't been invented yet. In particular, the beat of bossa nova, which is so distinctive, that actually emerges in Brazil in the latter part of the 1950s. But otherwise, the feel of bossa nova is very much in these records. And that's not too surprising for a couple of reasons. One is that Almeida, of course, was from Brazil, and he's drawing on the same samba sounds from his youth. But there's another connection, a really interesting one, and that is that this record and other records, particularly West Coast jazz records, not New York records, but the ones that came from the West Coast, were showing up in Rio and were absolutely seminal in the development of Bossa Nova because people like Tom Jobim, people like Luis Bonfa, Joao Gilberto, were trying to break out of the straitjacket of old school Sampa. And what they found was the chord progressions and the whole sound, West Coast jazz was just the kind of format they needed. So Samba plus West Coast jazz ends up giving birth to the bossa nova. But in the latter part of the 1950s, the West Coast scene and the Brazil bossa nova scene as it was emerging were existing very much in two separate worlds. And for the rest of the 50s, Shank's activities were almost exclusively focused on that classic West Coast cool sound. However, if jazz was king of the LA music scene in the 1950s, by the early 60s, it had been marginalized thanks to rock and roll and a variety of other developments and Shank found himself on the margins as well. The jazz records which had flown off the shelves before were now sitting in gathering dust, and so a lot of jazz musicians went into movies and TV and so on. Shank found himself doing kind of pop adjacent records that weren't particularly good, but the exception to this was his interest in world music, and he was heavily encouraged by his label boss, Dick Bach, to do some things of real artistic merit. By the early 60s, Shank was of course aware of the huge bossa nova boom worldwide, though he was not aware of his own role in it. 
He made a couple of great bossa nova records with Claire Fisher called Bossa Nova Jazz Samba, and there's another one called Brass Samba. Excellent records, despite the fact that there are no Brazilian musicians on them at all. But the ironic thing is that Shank, having been such an influence on the development of the whole genre of bossa nova, is very much on the outside looking in by 1962-1963. Eventually, you have to think this had to change, and it did change. In the fall of 1964, he gets an invitation to go down and play Argentina in early 1965, which he does. And he decides, because he likes bossa nova music and he's aware there's a whole scene going on, to stop off in Rio on his way home. And there he meets Tom Jobim, he meets Sergio Mendez, he meets Luis Bonfa, and he is absolutely amazed to find out that these guys all know who he is, they have all his records, and what's more, the sound that they've created, which is sweeping the world, was based on the music that he and Lorindo Almeida had done, in large part, because the chords that they had used and the approach they had used was very much the crack where the light gets in in their efforts to innovate and get away from the strictures of old samba. Needless to say, he's energized by this visit and he returns to LA and he starts to work with a guy called Joao Donato, who's a Brazilian piano player and composer who'd lived in LA for a number of years. They get working and then Sergio Mendes, whom Shank had met in Rio just a few months before, comes through LA with his group Brazil 65 and Dick Bach at Pacific and Shank see an opportunity to make a top-notch bossa nova record. My best guess is that this record is made sometime in the late summer of 1965. I can't find the exact dates when Mendez toured through LA, but it had to be around then because of the personnel. It is produced by Dick Bach and it's very likely made at Pacific Studios on West 3rd in LA. The group is a quintet. Shank is on alto sax. Donato, who composes several tracks on here, is on piano. And then there are three members of Sergio Mendez's Brazil 65, although not Mendez, of course, because he was a piano player. The guitarist is Rosinha de Valenza, or just Rosinha. She's a virtuoso in her own right, and she'd actually recorded already as a leader in Brazil for Alenco, the great bossa nova label. This is uh, her debut record for that label. Then on bass is Sebastião, or just Tiao Neto, who is pretty much the granddaddy of all bossa nova bassists, and he, of course, was the bass player on Get Gilberto. The final member of Brazil 65 and the final member of the quintet on here is Chico Batera, the drummer. He is one of the great drummers of the late 20th century in Brazil, and this is actually one of his very first appearances on record. Side one begins with Sausalito, which is a Donato composition. This track has Shank and Donato exchanging solos, but the primary impression I had anyway was of the tightness of the rhythm section. This rhythm section of Neto, of Batera, and of Rosinha, anyway, they can do no wrong in this record. The next track, Minha Saudade, is one on which Shank, unlike almost all the other U.S. jazz bossa crossover guys, he is not in Getz's shadow at all. He very much has his own feel, and it's no surprise, of course, because he, in a strange way, is in fact the originator of the sound that he's now playing. Sambo de Aviao is a perfectly executed Jobim standard. Then we have the highlight of side one, the track It Was Night, where Shank provides these great bookends to a very beautiful Donato piano solo. The last track on side one, Silk Stop, has more wonderful playing from Shank. Side two starts with Camino de Casa, which is a fast-paced number, which has the whole band swinging as one. Then we have Uma Brasso no Bonfa, or a tribute to Bonfa, and given the title, it's no surprise that the main takeaway here is Rosinha's amazing rhythm and lead work on guitar. Once I Loved is a gorgeously mellow and melancholy version of a gorgeously mellow and melancholy song, principally made famous by the Astro Gilberto version. Sambo Sambo has more lyrical excellence and interplay between the soloists and some wonderful drumming from Batera. And Tristeza and Mim is a rousing little number to end the record. I mentioned at the outset that this is one of the better outings by an American jazz player doing a jazz bossa crossover record. Does it scale the heights of, say, a Get Gilberto, which again is a pretty steep ask? And I have to say no, because that record is characterized by some really remarkable arrangements, and I think the arrangements here are just a tad busy. However, this record gets stronger and stronger as it goes along. And of course, it's helped by the fact that Shank gets the style. He understands it, he embraces it, and of course, fundamentally, in some roundabout way, he fathered it. Of all the jazz bossa crossover collaborations of the mid-1960s, this is one of the finest, and for me, it's four and a half out of five stars. <laughs>